42 years of age, and born on the shores of the North Saskatchewan River from the loins, the fiery loins of Hunter the Lynx. This version of the Edmonton Oilers are survived by Wayner. Good luck on TNT, buddy. Mac T and Kalo. They died early Tuesday morning, just past midnight, with a single shot past the pads of the eternal Mike Smith in the airportless city of Winnipeg, Manitoba. There'll not be a celebration of life, obviously due to the COVID-19 restrictions that are in place. The positive is that they will be resurrected in October with new life and a chance to play for the Silver Cup once again. Jeffrey! How's it going, buddy? How you doing? We're back. <laughs> Episode 27. Those I'm Canadian good. Lads podcast. I'm good, Brad. And how are you doing this evening? I'm pretty good. Uh, did you write an obituary? I did. I did. I don't I don't know if it's as good as yours. And I can, I'm looking at it right now, and I can see the spelling errors just littered throughout all of it. So... So I, I think before I, I can I can jump right into that, but I think I will offer up an apology to our dear listeners. Um, Brad and I were very uh, busy and enthralled with the NHL playoffs. Um, we did have good intentions of recording before the Oilers' first game. Uh, unfortunately, life happens, and we were busy. So no, listen, I was, you got, you, I was you, busy. I was well, busy, you, and I fucked this up. I fucked it up. You you know what? Everyone got a mini vacation from us. It's fine. I know the mini vacation they can all choose is to not tune in and listen, but but quite frankly, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder sometimes. So and we're coming in hot today, buddy. We're coming in hot. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> we're, we're gonna give some goodness to the dear listener in Virginia, the CIA. Is that where the CIA had your headquarters are in Virginia? Um, let's say yeah, yes, Langley, Langley, Virginia. Langley. Yeah, I think that is. Yeah, it's got to be Langley, Virginia. Um, all right, well, here, let me uh, let me knock this out because I'm not entirely p- proud of it. So let's just get it out of the way. And then we can dissect what, what went wrong in our lives over the last 10 days. So <clears throat> and I'm gonna, I, pre- I don't think I did as good of a job on this as I did for my grandfather. So sorry, Kali, I apologize from down below. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right, on... May 25th at approximately 12:10 a.m. Mountain Time, the Edmonton Oilers, the Edmonton Oilers 2021 season succumbed to its injuries inflicted by the Winnipeg Jets and passed away quietly into the night, surrounded by those that loved them watching on TV. The 2021 Oilers will be remembered for the incredible pace of points scored by Connor McDavid, 105 in a 56 game effort, as well as outstanding efforts by Leon Draisaitl, Tyson Berry, Darnell Nurse. Congrats on the baby. Mike Smith and Adam Larson. It should be pointed out that outside of the point totals compiled by McDavid, Dry, and Doc, they all improved on their defensive play. Apparently not enough for some writers and articles after the untimely passing, but hey, to each their own, I suppose. There was hope in Oiler country and on, and on those Canadian lads, but alas, an improved regular season and another second place finish in the division for the second year in a row was not enough to keep spring hockey on life support in the great city of Edmonton, Alberta. Credit where credit is due. The Winnipeg Jets played tough, disciplined games in a four-game sweep of the Edmonton Oilers, clogging up the middle with sticks and bodies in front of, reju- of rejuvenated Connor Hellebuck, that's a team that's learned to win in the NHL playoffs, and I wish them all the best going forward, especially if they play the Leafs. It's a time of reflection in Oilers country. Many will say that Dry and McDavid's careers are being wasted in Edmonton. I choose a different perspective. The team is only two years into new management and coaching, and have shown improvement the whole time. A core of players is established, and the roster could add depth. Sorely needed depth, with a $22 million worth of cap space in the offseason. The playoffs push on, and now the Oilers hit the links with the likes of the Flames and Canucks. But next year, next year, I'll hopefully be writing an obituary mentioning the second round of the playoffs, or dare to dream, beyond. So let's raise a glass to this beautiful, rotting corpse of a 2021 Oilers hockey season. Celebrate the successes while looking to improve the weaknesses. Soon enough, I'll get to critique professionals who apply their trade on the ice, behind the bench, or in the front office because I'm a dumbass who knows better. And who else knows more about a game than the professionals? Clearly a guy who gets drunk while watching them do it. Go Oilers. 
am I a bad person for wanting or liking Blake Wheeler getting an ultimate nut shot before I comment on your obituary? That's a that's a gamer. <laughs> that guy missed a little bit of the game after he went down and came back. I have all the respect in the world for Blake Wheeler now. <laughs> oh, really? I was yeah. like, good. good. I'm glad you got hit in the nuts. But no, Jeff, fantastic job. I, I thought that was really, really well done. I was at your uh, grandfather's funeral, and uh, and uh, yeah, <laughs> it was, yeah. I can compare both uh, o- obituaries, but both were were quite well, well done. That man, that man was clutch, and he knew it. <laughs> I think was exactly how it ended. <laughs> I'm, so I want to touch on a few things, and uh, before we dissect some of the hockey, perhaps um, you and I are very invested Oilers fans. Um, we've discussed this many times on the podcast. We have plenty of times history of watching this great game and this great team play. Um, obviously we were exchanging some text messages on Friday. I well, probably, yeah, that was, let's touch on that. So sure. they lose an overtime. I'm getting a feeling of the team. And I make a comment to you that they're done. And your response to me wasn't like, Hey, you know, they're not done. It was <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> I think I was at peak anger at that point. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think the uh, I think I was the, taken back, Jeff. I apologize. I did not mean to offend you. <laughs> I actually did. I was so offended that I responded back. Yeah, yeah, no, fuck me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it, it's it was a weird thing. Like, obviously, game one was disappointing. The the two empty net goals. So you're like, oh, that's a two one game. Realistically, I know somebody like, oh, it's four one. Oh, that's two one. Um, they lose on Friday. Um, they choke away the the four one lead on Sunday and then go into triple overtime on Monday, which was uh, a daunting task to stay awake for. But I got to say that from an emotional standpoint, and maybe I'm a little bit beaten down by this team to a certain extent, but after Friday's peak of anger and frustration, I really didn't feel anything going on past that. Like even when they were choking away the lead, I think I was just kind of quietly sitting there going like, Oh, why don't they just call a timeout? <laughs> just do this. So I don't know. Maybe I'm emotionally destroyed by this team and I've just accepted the abuse that comes with being a fan. Or maybe it was that they just didn't play terrible. They just didn't have enough depth. And that's kind of where I'm at is this team just doesn't have enough horses to, you know, other than dry saddle McDavid, their, their depth players just can't put the pucks in the net. And, um, I honestly think that Ryan Nugent Hopkins isn't a good hockey player for this team. You know, maybe he'll be a good hockey player somewhere else, but uh, maybe he'll work on his limp wristed uh, wrist shot and uh, maybe get a puck or two through the, uh, the defense uh, every once in a while. But uh, I'm not, you know, maybe a two, he has a good two way game. His two way game wasn't that good this year, but um, you know, maybe it's time to move on from the Nuge. Yeah, I think that's obviously for the uh, for Oilers fans, that's not going to be a um, popular opinion to have. I actually I look at his regular season and I don't be I'm not too harsh on it. Um, uh, I In regards to his points per game, I think he was just slightly below his career average because he's never really been an 82 point a game guy. He's typically in that point seven point seven three range and i think he finished in like 0.68 or something along those lines and maybe i missed a lot of things along the way but i don't think his puck possession numbers are all that bad but i will say though too that i don't believe he's probably an answer for this team going forward um probably a change of i'm not even saying necessarily needs a change of scenery i just i think that on the open market if you find somebody who's more complimentary towards playing with a McDavid or a dry sidle and they're going to cost a little bit less or even the same. Maybe that's the player you go grab instead of re-signing Nuge. Yeah. I, I don't think he is the answer. He doesn't have that, that extra gear. It seems like in the playoffs to step up his game and, you know, be a game changer um, in the Stanley cup playoffs. Be- if you look at what's going on in the playoffs, you know, players, amp it up you know they they take it to a next level and um we haven't seen that in from nuge in a play-in round this year's playoffs or even in 2017 you know it, it just it's not his 
it's not it, it's not his game i guess you know he's not a dirty player he's not a greasy player um he's not a physical player um he's a perimeter player and uh you know we have too many perimeter players too many people that are playing on the outside not getting in the dirty areas actually one guy that i was really impressed with actually two was devon shore um and alex chason the goal chason scored the other night uh, on the power play to take the lead uh, before Ethan Bear shot a puck up the middle of the ice and uh, Winnipeg went and scored and tied the game. Um, that being said, that he earned the right to be benched on that 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 occasion. <laughs> but uh, and maybe they should have traded him for Luke Debraska earlier in the year. But uh, I'm not saying uh, I was wrong, or I'm not saying I'm right. So. I will say I'm not willing to flush Ethan Bear's career with the Edmonton Oilers because of uh, three out of four bad playoff games. Now, I will admit those last two games, as much as I would love to defend Ethan Bear, holy man, those were some bad giveaways. I I don't know what that kid was thinking, unfortunately. So, um, Let's give him some love, though. The, the guy needs some, some love from Oilers Nation right now because of the racist pieces of shit out huh. there in Alberta which we talked about in our last podcast, you know, there's a, there's a group of people in our province that are just Neanderthals and they're living in, uh, in the dark ages, it seems like in, in racistville, Alberta, but yeah, like, um, obviously that's kind of not breaking news, but that's new news today. Unfortunately, uh, some people decided to attack Ethan bears game and his ability to be a hockey player or a person based upon race racist rhetoric um there oh i don't want to sound like a hero but there's no place for that of course there's not um but these are the dregs of society and i know that um you know ethan was you know it was good of ethan to address it today it was good of ethan to give a statement um i would love and i know ken holland did a statement as well but i would love for one of these guys to just come out and McDavid and Dreisler could do this on a different level, which we should address later. But you're like, okay, listen, my name is Ken Holland. I represent the Edmonton Oilers in this capacity at this press conference. Um, Ethan Bear is a player of ours. He is a good player. He is an outstanding citizen. He's a good human being. And you know what? For those of you who want to attack him based upon some racial rhetoric, go fuck yourself. We don't, we don't we want don't, you as a fan. We don't want you as a fan. Don't come in our building. Don't buy our gear. Don't engage with the NHL. Go fuck yourself and swallow a bullet, like I said last time on a podcast. But this is – the unfortunate reality, though, is that it is – it's a few assholes out there who are so Neanderthalic and stupid that they can't form a thought in regards to why would I want to say something negative about this person, so I got to go after some racial bias. It is ridiculous. So, Ethan, from those Canadian lads, fuck those people, man. We're on your side. Uh, no more giveaways up the middle, please. Yeah, please no no gut shot passes right up the gut. Oh, because we're gonna have, I'm gonna trade you. I'm gonna fucking trade you. Yeah, I'm not trading you. I'm keeping you. But yeah, Luke DeBrusque, straight up, yeah. Luke DeBrusque. Oh, love daddy, it. daddy can broadcast him every night. No oh, God, no, no Edmonton boy should come back and play in this city. It's too hard, man. <laughs> but okay, but you'd mentioned you'd mentioned something. So like, obviously, we should go through some of the hockey that has transpired. And I have to agree with your assessment that. There's not a. There's too many pro, uh, uh, what do you outside players on this on this team to perimeter win. players. Pro, per- perimeter. <laughs> I'm struggling with that word. <laughs> perimeter. But, if you were perimeter. in elementary school, the like perimeter of a triangle or a rectangle. <laughs> perimeter. <laughs> you only know that because your kids are learning that now. You didn't know that before. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> but the um, yeah, this team. This team is unfortunately. Uh, it's not you, – you look at how Winnipeg played the game against the Oilers, and all they had to do was clog up the middle and ensure that really no clean shots were getting on Hellebuck. And I know the Oilers outshot them quite a bit in a few games, but they'd always seem to even out towards the end except for, I think, game three. But, you know, it's it's one thing to get into the regular season, and everyone can say this. It's one thing to get the regular season, but once you get to the playoffs, it's a different beast. You, I'm going to sound like a sour fan, though, too. Sure. The refing in this series was a joke. I saw Connor McDavid get horse collared. There's a photo of it in game one. Right. He was horse. A guy grabbed his shoulder pads and yanked him back. 
Oh, okay, so this, this brings me to another thing. So I know that uh, I'd seen some comments that in that last game, there was 40 potential calls that Connor McDavid should have earned a penalty on. And I think somebody dug it up because he's McDavid was taking heat for not drawing a penalty. Is it time for the NHL to actually ref these games differently? Like, I don't want to sound like sour grapes, like you said. Like, I, the NHL refs their games in the playoffs the way they do. They completely change it from the regular season. Is it time for a change? I'm not the biggest Bob Stoffer fan, but he said it really well on Oilers Lunch or Oilers Now or whatever his show is called. But um, the NHL is brand by guys who aren't elite players. You know, the player safety guy is a goon. Um, everybody <laughs> who's Paris. Paris is a joke. Anyways, um, <laughs> all their all their top execs are, are people that were grinders that, that you know were obviously students of the game. Not McDavid, who's got you know the brain and the god gifted talent to to execute on the ice at the high speeds that he does. But um, the NHL has never done a good job of letting their star players play the game. Mario Lemieux. Um, you know, in later years in Gretzky's career, Steve Eiserman, Jaeger, oh. all these guys went through an error of clutching and grabbing. And, um, you know, that's that's not how you sell the game. You sell it with your top players. The people are going to be on your highlight reel every night. Um, and Connor McDavid did not draw one penalty in this entire playoff series um, out of the what? Two, two, three, four, uh, eight. You know what? Ten periods. I thought you were gonna. Played. I thought you were gonna say four games in a one, two. I was like, one, I, I can tell you it's four, <laughs> two, three, four yeah. games. Uh, but no, he didn't draw one penalty, and that's a travesty. Um, there were too many occasions where uh, the Winnipeg Jets just held on to him and slowed him up and interfered with him. Um, there was a friggin' penalty against Yamamoto in the first overtime period on on monday night um and there was nothing again the oilers couldn't draw one and i just don't get it i don't know if it's a it's a bias against mcdavid and dry settle or if they're trying to make them prove themselves you know or what it is but uh um i'm not i'm gonna i don't care if i sound like a sour fan they they deserve better in that regards to getting penalties uh drawn for them because they did they they basically you know, they just did a good job of trying to get uh, the other team to clutch and grab, and you should be penalized for that. Isn't that part of the rule book? But the upper, you know, senior people within the NHL, they uh, they they're biased. They they love the grinder role. They love the the guy who can't play the game the right way. I'm. I don't know if it's an executive level thing down. Um, I do believe it's probably one of those. Uh, the history of the game that uh, people don't want to seem to let go of. They, they go like, oh, well, you the greats did it before. Therefore, all these players have to do it at the same time. Now, uh, we've seen evolution in the rules in, well, in across all sports, but uh, we've seen the evolution of the rules in hockey. You know, Lemieux complained enough to finally get away with the clutching and grabbing to a certain extent. Uh, we've penalized open ice, open ice hits more than we typically had Um the, the, the fighting is not nearly as um, encouraged as it once had been. And it is you it is unique that is like at a certain point of the year. And this is coming from a guy who does really enjoy rough, tough hockey. And and it's one of those situations where you start watching and you're like, yeah, it, like what is going on here? This does seem alien. And, uh, and I'm not speaking as just somebody who watched the older games. Like I've been watching one of the things we talked discussed in the last podcast was I was very excited to finally see some of these American teams that I hadn't seen before. And it's very clear that across all the series, the refs are swallowing the whistles. And it does seem, it's like, well, we're changing and and evolving across the game. Why aren't we changing and evolving during the playoffs as well? Jeff, those Canadian lads likes it rough. Of course, you did that right when I was drinking some water. But um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, it is. It's it, it it you know. I don't. Know. I look at what the NHL is going to go into here with uh, a major broadcast deal with ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports, and uh, TNT, which Wayne Gretzky is now a lead analyst on. And I don't know if they ever seen Wayne uh, speak on TV, but uh, I'm hoping that he stepped down from the Oilers uh, yesterday to. Uh, go into some heavy, heavy, heavy 
training and broadcasting uh, education classes over the next little while because uh, he is not the most uh, uh, engaging uh, <laughs> person on the uh, on the telly, uh, you know, especially if you know, then I'm not going to go there anyways. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, I i agree with you uh i thought that was i thought that was a weird decision i'm not on the not on tnt's part because they're like probably like, oh he's the biggest name that's ever played the game man he is not good on camera he is he's good in the sense that like whenever he's on the sports net broadcast or lobbing him softball questions about the oilers and how much he likes watching Connor mcdavid play but holy man he is i that that's gonna be a short career I I think it's going to make the Phoenix coaching career look really successful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what did you think of that play, Wayne? Oh, he's a great young man. Good little guy. Good yeah. job. Yeah, I don't know. That's that's not a Charles Barkley esque or even Shaq uh, bring yeah, on for TNT. Yeah, I, I I was kind of excited to hear that TNT got it. You know, based on what they've done with the NBA broadcasts, and I'm like, okay, cool. Maybe they'll bring in some some guys who, you know, will bring some controversial takes or have bring an entertainment value to it. I actually tweeted out today. I'm like, bring on Bill Burr as the host. He's got a hockey acumen and, you know, loves the sport. And uh, he'd be a great host of, uh, of hockey on TNT. But uh, <laughs> they got, uh, they got Wayner. They, they're paying him three mil a year. So they probably, that probably ate up a lot of their budget. Actually, they should, um, uh, he's got his own hockey podcast, but it's Burr's buddy, uh, Bartnick. Uh, they should bring that guy on for it because he is a he's just a meathead who can talk hockey. He's he's quite entertaining. So they should bring on somebody like him. But but hey, who's to say? I'm sure TNT is going to have to evolve their model over a while. Having a guy like Gretzky or somebody come on to speak about things is going to probably um, yeah, it will draw some names and everything like that. They're well, quite frankly, they're going to be exposing an audience that does not has never gone to TNT for hockey. Like this is their first foray into that. And yeah, no, I too am excited about uh, what they do with the NBA. They've done a fantastic uh, product when it comes to their uh, halftime shows and how they break down the game. Hopefully they do the same thing with the NHL. And I I don't know if you've noticed this as well, but um, because of the restrictions in Alberta and things are hopefully lightening up to the greatest summer ever. Oh, but, it's the greatest summer ever. <laughs> but I've been fortunate to be home at about three o'clock typically in the afternoon and sit there with my laptop on my lap and I watch a uh, part of the interruption and around the horn, two great ESPN shows. I enjoy the amount of hockey content since they made that announcement. It's not tripled. It's not quadrupled. It is infinity more than I've ever seen on any of these ESPN broadcasts. That's awesome. It is good. And like, I don't know if you read Emily Kaplan. Uh, she obviously writes with great, uh, with Wyshynski, uh, I love her articles. I love her take. And she is fantastic on TV. She, ESPN should be pushing her front and center when it comes to anything they're going to do with the NHL going forward. I'm pumped because like there's going to be some uh, some heavy hitters. Even Stephen A. Smith was doing that hockey the other night. You know, oh, it, was, it was it was awesome. You know, like I'm, to get ESPN on board and actually be engaged and, you know, that it's going to only help grow the sport. Nobody was watching NBC Sports Net. Right. Yeah, I, I think it'll be a good move for the NHL at the end of the day. Um, and you, I think you can trust both TNT and ESPN to put a product out there. NBC, I, I don't know. I got nothing against NBC. It's just that it seems like it wasn't really a good product that they were putting out there. Nobody likes Pierre Maguire. So. <laughs> oh my God! Hopefully they don't bring Pierre Maguire back on uh, <laughs> on ESPN or TNT. Get- yeah, I think it's those, pretty safe there. Those tiny glasses of his. They picked up Ray Ferraro, though, apparently ESPN. So. Oh, I like Ray Ferraro. Yeah. So going back to the series per se. So obviously uh, the Oilers are going to need to make some improvements if they're going to try to win in a playoff style game. Because quite frankly, despite our complaints about how the refs are going to call it, it's not going to change. Um, I think it's realistically you're going to have to formulate your roster to uh, meet that kind of style of hockey. Uh, I'm hopeful that a guy like Archibald isn't uh, picked up by Seattle or cut loose at some point. I think they should keep him around. One of the few guys that was throwing the body left, right, and center. Didn't matter who, how big the guy he was hitting. So you always love that. His hit, though, in game three. You mean game one? No, no, where he got suspended. 
Oh yeah, uh, that one. Yeah, the yeah. hit in game one was a beauty. And when he game one, it was fantastic. Yeah, and didn't resolve. <laughs> it resulted in missing a game. Upon initial blush, what did you think of that hit? It didn't. I didn't really pay attention. I was like, I was like, this is awesome. Yeah, I didn't think anything of it either at first. Like upon a few replays, I was kind of like, yeah, I could kind of see where maybe <laughs> getting a little close to the knees there, but. Dude, what? I was excited that Blake Wheeler got hit in the nuts really, really hard. True. Like, true. Like, I'm not feeling too too much sympathy for uh, opposing hockey teams in the playoffs. It's war. You know, I've picked my side. Yeah. So, what side do you move to now? I don't. I don't. don't. I just, <laughs> I just watch. You know, it'd be nice to see a Canadian team win it, win it all. Oh fuck! And that. and entertaining. I'm not gonna lie. It'll be a little entertaining if the Leafs do win it. Oh God, no! I uh, why? I do not, why not? I do, I do not want a Canadian team to win the Stanley Cup. <laughs> why? Because I don't like the other Canadian teams. <laughs> yeah. So, so would you want another U.S. team to win the Stanley Cup? Well, there's no other teams from Mexico or Russia playing in this league. So, by yes, by <laughs> deduction, I am cheering for an American-based team. After why? What do I care if a Canadian team wins it? I don't like the Leafs or Canadians. I don't like the Canucks or Flames. Ottawa, I can stand. Why would I care? The cup crosses the border at least 15 times during the celebration anyways. So it's all, oh. What if Winnipeg wins it? Actually, I wouldn't mind that. There you go. Yeah, I wouldn't mind that, but. They can drive it up to to the city. I would love to. I would love to if they do play the Leafs. I I will be pulling heavily for the Jets to knock out the Leafs. Now, once they get past that point, I will wait and see who they play against. But but ju- from what's left in this division, I will be pulling for the Jets. I suppose. <laughs> I I am looking so forward to the divisional realignment. This Canadian division is junk. I do not like it. I never want to see this crap again. Well, thanks to Jason Kenny in September. In October, in October next year, well, this year, <laughs> you're going to be able to go and sit in your season seats at an Oilers game without a mask if you choose, because we're going to go through the best summer ever, and you're going to be able to watch your hockey team in person. And the next time they make the playoffs, you can be there. And that's going to make a difference. You can't tell me that the American teams that have had fans in the stands, ha- they're like, there's an emotional part of the of playing the game, you know. Oh, and I think yeah. that I think that would have made a difference. I honestly do, especially with the Oilers in uh, in this series. Josh Archibald putting that guy Demello through the boards, literally on in game one. Rogers Place would have been like on fire. People would have been oh, lighting yeah. their seats on fire. Ripping them out of the cement, right? Like, <laughs> like to- finding like so- out about UFOs that are going to happen here. Like so many toilets, <laughs> toilets <just> ripped <laughs> right out of the fucking floor. Yeah, no, I I agree with you. If you, obviously having your fan base in the building makes a world of difference. Like we've been to playoff games. Um, it, uh, hockey fans, if you hadn't had a chance, do yourself a favor, forego any regular season game for the chance to go to one playoff game and experience the crowd when something like an Archibald hit happens or or somebody scores a, a late minute goal. It is, it is an experience and a half. And, you know, as somebody who is part of a fan base, a passionate fan base, when Rogers place and go, going back to Rexall, when those places erupted, the, it was like your skin was, sta- was you're coming out of your skin with excitement and the energy in that building. It is you know, my, my favorite part of going to a playoff game versus a regular season game, like, people are pretty subdued during a, a regular season game. They're, you know, they're cheering. They get excited. You know, the, the win, everybody's having a good time at a playoff game. The worst of people comes out. Like the hatred comes out for the other team, like grown men screaming, you know, to kill another guy. Like, I remember we were playing San Jose a couple years ago and like the swearing and just the, Oh, the passion from the fan base. Like, kill him. Kill that son of a bitch. <laughs> it's just like, I was like, yes. Yes. Give me more of that. I'm not going to lie. I was part of that. I enjoy doing that. Oh, yeah. I like to mix it up at the games. I'm used to that loud mouth. Going. 
I'm I'm a loud mouth at games. <laughs> Gets the old heart heart pumping, you know. Yeah. No, it is. Uh, it will be interesting. Obviously, like the, re, I know, I'm I'm not one to put an asterisk next to uh, when teams win championships. We'll wait and see who comes out of this. But obviously, Tampa had a unique championship last year, coming out of the bubble. Uh, we'll wait and see who wins this one. But regardless of that, these these are going to be the two weird seasons that everyone kind of goes, yeah. That, those teams earned those wins and those teams won those championships, but it was a reduced amount of games. It was coming out of a bubble. It's just like this was, and if you're much like the Oilers uh, and the Leafs now, it's just like, this is an opportunity to steal a championship for a team. Like I'm not, I know Pittsburgh just got eliminated by the Islanders. What if the Islanders just cruise on through and get, get through another, they're a bad team. They haven't they've been a great team for, for like a few years now. How would but, this be stealing a championship? They're playing seven game series. Well, because you don't, if you don't play the 82 games, who's to say who wouldn't have got hurt in an 82 game season? Who's to say who wouldn't have caught fire after the 60th game with 22 left to go? So you, on those shortened, you know, lockout seasons, you, you put in asterisks against those teams that have won the Stanley cup. Well, I think that the, I'll even go back to the Oilers making the Stanley Cup final in 06. That was coming off that year break. Carolina and Edmonton didn't come anywhere close after that. I think that was a unique opportunity for each one of those teams to get far and then crash and burn almost immediately thereafter. How do you figure? They played a full season. Yeah, but they came off a season where they didn't play the previous season. What is that? Everybody else didn't have to play. Yeah, so I'm saying it's... How's that unique? You played a full friggin' season of the year. 82 games. How's that unique? It's unique because they didn't play the previous season. What yeah, but so did the other teams. They All the other 30 teams or whatever in the league didn't okay. play either. So then you don't think it's any coincidence that the Oilers and Hurricanes did nothing after that? No, Nothing at Oilers all? The, the Hurricanes and Oilers didn't do anything because their management frigged their teams up. Chris Pronger left Edmonton. Pekka yeah. left. Spashek left. You know, all we were left with was a pulled groin of Dwayne Rollison. And uh, who who did we pick up from the New York Rangers? Uh, Peter Sikora. Peter Sikora. Okay, where did Carolina finish in the in the regular season of that year? In what year? <laughs> when, they, when they went to the Stanley Cup final. I don't know. Eighth, maybe? I don't know. Exactly. You have two eighth place teams get to the Stanley Cup final, and you don't think that there's some weird coincidence behind that? No. Yeah, there is. There's not. Yeah, I'm, I'm not arguing with you it anymore. I, I'm I think, telling you. No, it's you. It, it is completely like when you have unique when you have new, unique incidents where there is interruption in play, whether it be during an entire lockout, a lockout of an entire year, or multiple games removed from seasons, and then going to play in a bubble, the flow of what a regular season is from season to season has been disrupted. And that's exactly what's transpired in the last two seasons, and then going back to after the lockout. Tampa Bay was one of the best teams in the league last year. Yeah. And they, and they won the Stanley Cup. Yeah, in the previous year, they got knocked out in the first round. That was a fluke. <laughs> <laughs> Clump, didn't Columbus take him the seven games in that first round again? That's a fluke. No, okay. You you had nothing but just words. So we're No, you're crazy, though. The 2006 playoff run, again, a really long time ago, but that's... That's just good hockey. A team that made the right moves at the trade deadline, you know, yeah. started to gel as a team has nothing to do with the, the lockout season the year before. Yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. Yeah, you had tons of players sit around for an entire year, except for the guys who play in the AHL, like the playing for the Edmonton Roadrunners. Yeah, and then Rafi Torres and Jared Stoll. And then I'll and then I'll, once again I'll use your argument against you. They had an 82 game full season. The last two seasons have not been 82 full game seasons. So are there players who didn't get into their full stride before they got going? What is the whole season missing a whole season or playing in the minors have to do with a full 82 game season? Well, I'm moving on from that part here, but I'm saying that compared to the last two seasons, your argument is that an 82 game season is an 82 game season. The last two seasons have not been 82 game seasons. Yeah, but neither were the short and locked out years either. So you're, you're saying that these are not unique seasons. That these aren't opportunities they're, for team. They're unique, but when you get to the playoffs, so any any team there's that, no there's no there's no difference in the playoffs. You're still playing seven game best of seven series. 
except for the teams that qualified. So let's say that let's say that Nashville, let's say they get through, but Smashville, Smashville, but they didn't. They they caught fire at the forty two game mark as opposed to the sixty game mark. They wouldn't have stuck into the playoffs and be looking at a totally different series. So that's what I'm saying. These are it's it takes time for teams to get going. And if you have a 56 game season or a shortened season cut off and then you go into a bubble, like obviously there was teams that did not catch their stride when they went into the bubble last year. Oh, the Oilers are one of them. They were so you agree with me. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Idiots. I don't know. Dumbass. Anyways, because I'm fired up now, I want to actually go on to something else here. So I am. I'm not a homer entirely. I am kind of a homer. I want to talk about something about how much heat Connor McDavid takes for not going to a Stanley Cup final in his by his 24th birthday. It is ridiculous how much heat that guy takes from the press, from fans, from idiot commentators on Sportsnet. This is my own problem. I go read the fucking comments on Sportsnet's website. Is that Mark Spector? No, no. Well, it is Mark Spector, but it's also the guys who comment on his articles and everyone else. This is a 24-year-old guy playing a team game. And I was just kind of, and am, I, am I completely crazy? Is it Should he have won a Stanley Cup at this point in time? I just went through some of the, like, the previous five years and then some of the greats. So, like, even look at the Lightning. The two best players, Kucherev and Stamkos, 27-30. St. Louis, O'Reilly, Tarasenko, 28 each. Two, 2018 with Washington, Ovechkin is 33. Crosby, uh, isn't it? Crosby and Malkin are exceptions, winning in, uh, obviously early when they were 23. Even look at Chicago during the success. Kays and Tain were 27. Go to some of the greats. Iserman, 32. Lemieux, 26. Sackick, 27. Bork, 41. Uh, some of the best players that don't have a cup while in the last decade. Giroux, Tavares, Wheeler, uh, Jamie Benn. Some of the great leaders. Thornton, Marlowe, no cups. The amount of expectation that this kid or not even kid this this young man should have a fucking cup ring by the age of 24 and therefore he's wasting his career and that oh the opportunities are drying up this what you think this guy's going to retire in four years time this is a ridiculous argument in regards to the assessment of mcdavid's ability to play the game and i know i'm defending arguably the best player in the world which is insane because you don't have to defend mcdavid but it is absurd that one, as soon as the playoffs are uh, wrapping up and they get eliminated, everyone's critiquing his defensive game again. The guy finished the season with like a plus 21. He completely f- effect changed his defensive game. And what is it with people who just need to tear down the best guy? It's, I'll admit, I did the same thing with Peyton Manning. I hated Peyton Manning when he played for the Colts and the Broncos. But it's because he was one of the best fucking quarterbacks to ever play. This is, this is sour grapes. So there, sorry, I had to get that off my chest. What bothers me is that it's Euler fans doing the critiquing. Enjoy what you have in front of you because one day it will either be gone for him retiring as an Euler or he'll get fed up with the bullshit of the media, the city, the, you know, shit that happens here being yelled at at a restaurant with his parents, you know, by some goons after an Euler game. You know, a couple of years ago, there's no reason why he should have a cup yet. It's a it's a process. I'm in complete agreement with what Ken Holland is doing. We've gone from a team that was complete garbage. Peter Shirelli was a terrible general manager. He completely ruined this roster. And Ken Holland was dealt a shit deck of cards. And now we're starting to pull ourselves out of the fire a little bit. And everybody's now crying because we don't have a cup yet. Well, you know what? You just don't get a cup. You need other players around Connor McDavid to get a cup. You need a goaltender. You need defensemen. You need depth scoring. You know what? We did not play bad. Yeah, we got swept in four. Most other years, I would have been a raving lunatic. You know, just losing my mind. You know, I was mad in game two when they lost, but... Looking at game three and four, I'm like, we lost by a goal. We went to three overtimes. One bounce. The winning goal on the game one was a double deflection. Yeah. A bounce here and a bounce there. It's a different story. We could have swept them. But we don't we didn't have the depth scoring. 
And and that's what we need to fix. But for people, that narrative of that, oh, he hasn't won a cup yet. They, you know, we're losing the best years of his life. He's only 24. I can't wait to see him when he's 27. Yeah. This is it. It's just like to write off the career or like, oh, obviously he's wasting his time. Like, you, I know I know everyone loves to compare him to Crosby. And there, it's a natural comparison. These are two generational talents. And I will point out, too, that it's just like, I know he's got a C on his chest. And I know you and I have disagreed in the past about the importance of the C on the chest. I, for one, think that if you're a leader in the dressing room, regardless of what's on your jersey, you're a leader in the dressing room. The The other players will respect you if you're a leader. Um, yeah, McDavid might not win a Marc Messier fucking leadership award one day, whereas somebody like Crosby might. But that doesn't mean that you write him off and just go like, well, he obviously he can't be a complimentary leader in this situation. It's like there's can be other leaders in that dressing room. And just to like... I don't know. I it's one of those situations where it is just sour grapes, and it's easy to tear down the big, the best, the biggest and best of the of the league. And yeah. you're hundred you're one hundred percent right. This team theoretically is ahead of schedule. Yes, I know everyone's like, oh, it's been thirteen years. Yeah, it's been thirteen years. As a fan, it sucks. I've watched a lot of bad hockey as a result. This management team and this coaching team have had two years to make a dent on this team, and it's improved. But for, through the two seasons that they've had control of it, two seasons where they don't play 82 games. There were idiots in the fan base that were saying that Tippett did a good, did a bad job and he should have been, he should be fired. They should move on from him. Yeah. Like, that's absurd. I'm, I hate these fans. I, I hate these people that come out and just throw shit out there and like, Oh my God. Like, listen, People will fail in the NHL. Tippett may not win a cup with this franchise. That's a possibility. It's probably a strong possibility given the level of competition. We haven't had good coaching for years. Yeah. But it's one of those situations where it's just like, yes. Do I think Tippett could have made better game by game adjustments against the Leafs? Yes, I do think that. I also think he could work. He'll probably work on that. And so will the players that got railroaded in those games. But just to, like yeah, like you said, some idiot who goes, well, they should just fire him. This is the exact example I gave during my eulogy where I'm like, well, clearly I know more about this because I get drunk while watching them play. It's like, that's the stupidest thing ever. These people know more than I do about this game. They know more. They've experienced it. They've lived through it. You know, they're helping lead Connor McDavid, you know, down the right path. And what really had me, you know, kind of, you know, help me as a fan kind of get through, you know, obviously the, the loss a little bit was listening to McDavid and how he was speaking about, you know, the team and the process. And, you know, he wasn't sitting up there whining and pointing fingers, you know, they, they took positives out of what happened because again, they only lost by a goal in three games. They weren't blown out. Yeah. They had a hiccup in great game three where they were up. And it could have turned the series around, but it's like one shot away and they they're up three. I do have to admit that I was I'm a little bit surprised by your positive approach to this. I really didn't expect this out of you. I didn't expect it out of me. As well. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. I thought I was going to be an emotional wreck. And to be honest with you, I was like building it up in my head. I was so excited for playoffs. You know, we've all been going through the COVID restrictions and all the the craziness that was going on there. And, you know, it was good to look forward to something like playoffs. And it was, it was awesome. Like it was, it was fun. But um, as a fan, as somebody who, you know, you have season tickets, I pay for tickets. I, go to games, you go to games, we buy jerseys, we buy food, we support the Oilers in every which way we can. Um, I'm happy with where we're at and I'm excited now because we've got a ton of cap room. We're going to be able to make some potential moves. We've got players like Dylan Holloway coming up. You know, there's a lot of positivity around this team. Now, Ethan Bear, if you keep throwing pucks up the middle of the ice, Again, I'm going to call for your your your, <laughs> your butt to be traded. But uh, that being said, you know there's just there's too many good things. You got Bouchard out there, uh, man. If Barry gets resigned, I'm going to laugh so hard. <laughs> um, anyways, there's there's a 
good positive vibe around this team. The the leaders, which in it's the core of Dry Sidle McDavid and Nurse, they look like and sound like champions in the way they handled this. And that only boasts for good things going forward with this team. Yeah, I as I said I remain hopeful. I do believe that there's plenty of reasons to be positive about what the future holds. Obviously, this offseason is going to be fairly important with the amount of cap room available, the amount of space that needs to be filled up. And, you know, as I said, it looks like we're going to have some young talent coming up here, which is always exciting because, quite frankly, as an Oilers fan, you're always hoping for the next big thing. So now switching gears slightly, but the Oilers have been eliminated um you in a pod previous podcast had alluded to a vision something that you had seen coming because of the playoffs and you were ref- you were hesitant to make your picks as a result of that vision is it safe to assume that your vision has not come true because of the owner's elimination i think because i had that vision that <laughs> the it vision, the person Yeah, like, so I think it got railroaded because I said it out loud. That's probably what happened, that I was alluding to the vision that the the team was going to do extra well this year. But uh, so I probably jinxed the Oilers. It's my fault. I'll take it. I'll own it. I'll own it, (laughs) Oilers fan. It's my fault. I jinxed the team by thinking good thoughts. So was there anything spectacular about this vision other than the Oilers winning the cup? Was it was it? A goal, final goal scored against a specific team. What was? No, it? No, 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 it was, it was just, just them winning. <laughs> I was just feeling good. Are you the twelve-year-old boy inside me? Was just like you gotta win the cup. They gotta win the cup, man. This is this is a legit question. I think I should know this about you already. At this point in time, I you've never struck me as a superstitious person. Do you do you believe that your vision and your belief in that vision is what jinxed a franchise that you have no control over? Yes. <laughs> I, I, I called the Calgary Flames and Tampa Bay Lightning um, going to the Stanley Cup in 2005 or 2004. 2004. Before I the call- interruption and then the unique season that followed it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I yeah. called that. I, I said it was a men's league hockey game. And I'm like, you know who's going to make the Stanley Cup finals? It's Tampa Bay and Calgary. And they they did. And that's why I thought my vision was correct. Because I once <laughs> had, a, had a previous vision of hockey hockeyness thank god i didn't place any bets on this vision yeah no kidding i uh i don't know i just think it's funny i was uh i was t- i had a lot of conversations about superstition with people leading up through the four game series here and i was actually is as somebody who believes in ufos and ghosts and all that type of crap i was surprised by how many people are far more superstitious than i am and i'm not really superstitious at all to be honest but because you believe in the reality of what's going on in the world, Jeff. I, well, I, that's why I believe in UFOs, obviously. But that, that, it's one of those situations. Like I acknowledge as a as a fan, if I drink a certain beer while sitting in a certain part of my couch, I'm not affecting the team in the least bit. It is just I'm just watching a game. But I am surprised by how many people have their little routines for it. Maybe I need makes, to develop one. It it makes the game fun, right? It, it allows you to get more engaged. You know, you got to wear your favorite jersey or. Like you said, sit in your favorite seat or have your... I, I had to have a Coors Banquet before every game because uh, that's what I would drink at Rogers if I was there, so. Yeah, they need a better beer selection at Rogers. <laughs> I like the Banquet, man. Johnny uh, Lawrence drinks that shit. Johnny Lawrence? Cobra Kai? I don't watch. I haven't seen it yet. You haven't seen that show? No, I haven't seen it yet. Oh my God, Jeff. Oh, I don't know. It's I'm re- so good. I'm, I'm reading textbooks about back injuries. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> I don't have time. You're supposed to give some back injuries with some kicks to the back, like Cobra Kai style. Apparently. Like apparently. Miguel and Cobra Kai. <laughs> that's, a, that's a spoiler. So I think we've kind of, we've um, exercised the ghosts and the demons of this Edmonton playoff uh, loss. Um, obviously, I think we, you and, it's safe to say you and I are both very, excited about what the future holds here i think we're remaining positive on this um is there anything you wanted to bring up before we start wrapping up for the evening yeah i wanted to ask you about uh the comments that ron mclean made in his uh in his uh joke that he made last night oh you'd have to tell me well i'm not going to say the joke but it was uh essentially (laughs) 
taken in a in a homophobic light. So um, he was called to task today by the uh, the people on Twitter and uh, out in social media. But uh, I'll give you a few seconds to bring it up. But basically, he was commenting on a a picture uh, on the back of Kevin BX's uh, um, uh, mantle where he puts bit different pictures up every once in a while. And it was uh, a reference to being having his tarp off, which is your shirt. So if you go tarps off, that means taking your shirt off. So, but uh, Ron came out with a very lengthy uh, apology. Um, kind of funny that uh, he uh, uh, is the guy who threw Don Cherry under the bus uh, to protect obviously his career. Um, but uh, I don't know. I don't know. If, I don't know if all Ronnie's going to make it out of this one. He probably will. Uh, he's got nine lives, but uh, yeah, I, I thought I'd bring that up, but uh, caught you off guard there. So sorry. You did. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't heard about it. Sorry. I'm. Uh, is... Are you like watching the video? <laughs> is he? Yeah, I am. Sorry. Uh, is he alluding to the fact that Kevin BX is positive for AIDS? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know what? I. I I don't know. I'm pretty eat loosey goosey with things. I've um, I alluded to the fact that I admired Rod Brindamore playing frisbee in Commonwealth Stadium. I if um, Ron wants to make fun of Kevin BX for having a picture of a guy with his tarp off, <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm okay with that. I just don't. I don't. I don't think I quite understand where the joke's coming from. So yeah, I think you'll have to watch it. You can you can comment it back on. Uh... The next time around, but uh, just shifting gears a little bit, though, um, it, Jeremy Corbell, he's the gentleman who released the pyramid flying uh, UFOs over the uh, warships uh, in 2019. He also released the video of the submersible UFO um, that was uh, authenticated by the Pentagon, saying that it is uh, real footage from a uh, U.S. Navy warship. Uh, it's basically a UFO um, floating or flying above the ocean and then essentially going into the ocean. Um, he's coming out tomorrow uh, with a, another video release, so it'll be interesting to see what he comes down. There's the, the, the UFO Twitterverse. Uh, they've called it Miraculous May uh, with all the stuff that's come out in regards to uh, the UAP UFO whole, um, I guess mainstream media blitz that's happened be it cnn 60 minutes fox news abc new york times uh the list goes on and on it's becoming the the hot topic barack obama admitting that you know there's definitely things that are out there that they don't know what they are on james corden show um it's getting crazy like we picked this up like you know, less than a year ago when we started off this podcast and it's kind of been fun just to talk about, but you know, we've been talking about this topic basically for 27 episodes and um, we're hitting into June now where this uh, congressional report supposed to come in, come out. And there's a, there's a lot of information uh, that's starting to become leaked out like these videos by Jeremy Cabell. Um, and it'll be re really interesting to see what he releases uh, tomorrow. But uh, there is definitely a lot of hubbub uh, going on with this topic, and it's becoming front page news. And I never saw it coming, to be honest with you. I, I thought that it would always be in the background. And we were thinking that with the Biden administration, we had said at one point that this was going to just kind of die out and fizzle away. Well, I I still stand by the fact that depending on what comes out, they could theoretically like, yeah here's a handful of videos. You guys have them now. Uh, they're whether or not we get the full report or the full extent of what they could have unearthed is yet to be determined. And I, we probably don't know the answer to that anyways, but um, I, I think, I think we'll get, I think we'll get something that will entice the imagination. I think, uh, I think if there is something that's truly of uh, national security that the Americans don't want to go hit the public's, ears while while maybe doing a few conspiracy theories in regards to increased military spending i i think they're still going to control how much information gets out i don't think it'll be a free-for-all but has the has there been another individual who has benefited more from the last six months of this expose than jeremy corbell oh my god uh, yeah this guy is 
this guy's this guy's documentary career is going to go through the roof when he finally goes and makes another double couple another couple docs. Well, I just like thinking about like even if this does explode and become, you know, just m- groundbreaking and a shift and like the biggest news story in history. Eventually, you know, there's people on the front lines of this with like Lua old NDA Lou Elizondo and Christopher Mellon and James Fox, who did the phenomenon documentary. And then you have Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp. Like these guys are like pioneers of like the UFO, like disclosure of 2021. Like this is, this is like, like people like, you know, breaking, like truly like breaking, you know, societal norms, right? Like it's, it's crazy. Oh yeah, like uh, obviously uh, journalists. Um, we all know famous journalists um, who have made a whole career of this. Jeremy Corbell has effectively become that for the UFA, UFO phenomenon. Um, it is it is wild. I just I just can't believe how often I've seen this guy pop up. And as I said he's going to benefit from the fact that he is just being brought on on uh, national and local news to talk about this as if he's an expert of it. Because quite frankly, nobody is. Um, maybe there are some people like Lou who actually know information that they can't discuss. And maybe they are people who know way more than we ever would want to know or what we hope to know. But Jeremy Corbell is probably not that guy. <laughs> he just happens to be front and center because he gets he knocks out a video every like uh, three or four weeks. Obviously, somebody's either taken a liking to him or they're playing him or whatever but like he's gotten some pretty hardcore stuff here like his name's associated now with all these this leaked leaked footage this is crazy oh that's just it it's just like he is he is famous by association and now and his biggest name to fame was the bob lazar area 51 documentary that he did i want to say what two years ago yeah i think but i and i said i stand by that doc it's a good documentary it's a good I, dog. I, yeah, I don't I know if it. Bob Lazar is legit, but I would, will tell. I, I do think, I think, as I said, that's what I'm more, I think we're going to find out it's more closer to the Bob Lazar story that we have some sort of substances that the government's kept under wraps. But I think that will be the extent of it. But I think that will legitimize a guy like Bob Lazar and actually probably Jeremy Corbell to a certain extent, a lot more than I would have originally anticipated. You imagine like, let's say it's real and you come out you know, to the public basically in fear that your life is at risk and you say this outlandish story and you hold on to that outlandish story and you never change your tune over what, 40 years, you know, 30, 30, 40 years. And like, and now all this stuff is coming out. He's probably like sitting back just hoping that, you know, something breaks that he was talking about that legitimizes his his story and because people look at him as a loon still like i would assume so yeah yeah so like that would be life-changing as well because the stigma uh, against these people it's like it's kind of like the uh the fighter pilot that uh, is alex dietrich she was the wingman of uh david fravor david sex fravor uh that was sorry uh, what his, his, that's his, like, you know how Maverick, like, it's his, like his call sign. Yeah. His call oh. sign. It was sex. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. His David, <laughs> David sex frame. Hey, that's, if that's like the kid at school who that he's like, that's my nickname. I'm like, you've never had sex. <laughs> <laughs> you made that up. Yeah. It's just like, if you call yourself that you've never had sex, <laughs> but this Alex Dietrich, she has come out and she's, uh, I think she teaches at one of the Naval Academies now, but uh, she's more in the public sector. But uh, they both said if they were alone and they saw this, it would never have seen the light of day. Yeah. And there's, there are probably the safety in numbers. It's, it's like I always say that if I was going to die on a roller coaster accident, I would want other people with me. (laughs) So it's just like, so yeah, you feel better knowing there's other people seeing and witnessing and experiencing what you're experiencing. Do you have any inside tracks of the West Edmonton Mall uh, roller coaster uh, uh, disaster back in the '80s that you worked there? 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think I was two <laughs> when that took place. I could, I, I, I maybe this another t- another podcast, but I, yeah, that place is haunted and it is weird in there. I will definitely say that. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, that being said, so this Alex Dietrichs or Dietrich, um, she's had like skeptics call her and like yell at her, I guess. And she did an article and she just seems like a normal person. Like the way she talks about it, she was, she just joined Twitter last week after being on 60 minutes. And she's just like, you know, throw out to UFO Twitter. Hey, everybody, you know, like just like being very, <laughs> very naive. Right. But, uh, you know, it's hard not to believe her. And and what she talks about, right? It's uh, she comes off very like uh, sincere about it, right? That it's you know, yeah, she definitely does. And unfortunately, she's probably walked into. Unfortunately, it's like a baby chick, a baby chicken walking into a a wolf nest or something like to just be like, come online and go, hey everybody, I'm the I saw a UFO. Yeah, you're right. She's going to get attacked left, right, and center because we're so fucking entitled now to blast away at somebody online. It's absurd, but... You liar! You're a freaking liar! Yeah. You're a liar! I love you. You know, I, I think for every time that you say something with certainty online while attacking somebody, if you get mis- if you get proved wrong, or even remotely that you weren't 100% correct, that person's allowed to hit you in the head with a baseball bat. Or nice. just... Yeah, but it should be. It should be a situation where you have to be careful about what you say to these people. Whether it be about something stupid like UFOs or sports, blah, 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 or just things in politics. If you get proven incorrect, that person gets a free shot at you somehow. I just love the, like, the vileness out there and just, like, the matter of fact. Like, some lady on... this, This one lady on Twitter, I just... I want to respond, but I know what it's going to, what it's going to cause. And it's going to cause me getting even, even madder. But like, <laughs> she like, Kenny comes out with like these, this plan, yeah, an actual plan to get out of this mess that we're in, like good or bad or indifferent. Like it's a plan. And the tweet, like literally the tweet is this period is period wrong period. And it's just like, it's a f- what's your fucking plan then? Yeah. What's Everyone- your idea? Do you want it? Like, are you okay just not seeing anybody or going anywhere or doing anything or, you know, or do you just break the rules and go on Twitter and, you know, say you're following all the rules? I, just, I guarantee you, everybody's not just locking themselves in a room and, you know, waiting for this thing to end. No. No, yeah, but as I said, it, it goes into the entitlement of everything, everybody. But I don't know. I I would advise you not to because I seem to recall you would you've either canceled accounts or swap between accounts because of the feed you get. So I would say that don't do that. <laughs> I I have to check before I tweet because I do have my own personal account, and uh, I do often comment with the Canadian lads one when we do have podcasts and things like that. But I I don't you know, go and do the controversial stuff on, on the together, the together <laughs> feed, because we're together on it. We, we don't want to, you know, we may not share that viewpoint. Yeah. We, we may not share the same, the same viewpoint. And that makes for a good podcast, Jeff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. When, especially when we will on a lie about the uniqueness of NHL seasons. But um, before we sign off, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you a question because I had this happen today. So I was driving to work uh, after working out this morning and I had realized that after getting cleaned up that I had not applied deodorant. You. I have never been so fucking worried about walking past somebody in the hallway at work, even with masks. (laughs) It's like I in my mind, I reeked of B.O. before like an hour into my day. (laughs) No, nobody would even fucking noticed. I don't think so, but I just, I was amazed by how much it rattled me almost immediately. And I honestly, like, I don't think I lifted my arms all day as a result of it. It's just weird how in um, insecure you can get about one simple thing so quick in the course of your day. <laughs> Teams meetings for everybody who are even next door to you in offices. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. So I try to limit any exposure. So uh, that being said, have you... Uh, would you go a day without deodorant? Test your test your fortitude in regards oh, to yeah, your, yeah, yeah, totally. I I, I got to go and start working out again, but you know, 
Thank you, Jason Kennedy, for uh, opening up the gyms here soon, by the way, too. He Go hasn't opened the gym. gyms yet. They're they're coming. The, yeah. the whole the whole plan. The whole plan is in place. Him and his buddy uh Shandro, they got a plan. So maybe we'll touch on that uh coming up in the upcoming podcasts. Um well that being said, too, you know, for the dear listener, um, I think we're gonna do a, a re-education, uh, bring you up to speed on who we are again. Um, you know, try to uh to uh we're 27 into these things, so uh, we've done 27 of these episodes. We, there's going to be some new listeners coming on, I'm sure. And uh, we should re-educate <laughs> them of who we are and what we're all about and uh, keep going strong. And we'll try to keep things rolling here through the summertime. And, uh, uh, you know, lots of good fun coming forward on those Canadian Lads podcast. <laughs> I love the enthusiasm that new listeners are on their way. <laughs> they're on their way. Hey, they're on their I, way. I guarantee you they're coming. Okay. All right. Well, I will say that that will be good. Yeah, we uh, will definitely knock out of knock out some more of these over the summer. Maybe some reduced hours due to getting away from it all, which is a good idea, dear listener. We encourage you to do the same thing. So, that all being said, I'm officially done for the evening. Brad, anything to leave us with? Any words of wisdom? Yeah, no, it's going to be good. And like I said, uh, when you say we're going to be shorting things up, I'm sure we'll be going to the final season of the CFL, getting ready for the XFL-CFL merger and all that kind of good stuff. So, uh, no, I got nothing else tonight, Jeff. You have a wonderful evening. Thank you, dear listener, for joining us again on those Canadian Lads podcast. And uh, let's uh, let's leave them wanting more, Jeff. Absolutely. <laughs> Should have taken that philosophy about 25 minutes ago. But yeah, dear listener, thanks for listening in. Have yourself a good night. Thanks again for listening to those Canadian Lads podcast. Give us a follow on social media. We're on the Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you like what you heard, give us a follow and share it with your friends. Thanks again and have a great night.